Today we're going to take part in the most sacred ceremony or service that we participate in as Christians. In the scriptures we know that there are two ordinances that are given to us, really two commands that are given to us. One is, is that we partake in the Lord's Supper in remembrance what it is that Jesus Christ did for us. And the other being baptism, that after a person received Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior, that they follow Him in baptism. Of both of these things, Jesus Himself took part. It was our example. And he shared with us, or He told us, that we are to do them as well, so that we might remember Him. Now, I, I don't know about you, but I have a lot of problems with remembering things. Some of you have already figured that out. Um, the hardest thing for me is to remember names. You may tell me your name and five minutes later, I'm thinking I know that person, but I cannot remember their name. And uh, someone earlier this morning introduced himself to me, and I know they've introduced themselves to me two or three times, and I was thankful that they did because I still didn't remember their name. So help me out. You tell me your name, I'll continue to tell you, tell you mine. And, in a very short time, we'll, we'll figure that out, okay? But um, I do have trouble remembering names. Um, I have trouble with my memory just in general. If you were to ask me what I ate last night, I may or may not remember it. Any of you have that problem? Uh, if I were to ask you what I preached last Sunday, I bet a lot of you don't even remember from last Sunday to this Sunday. It's okay. I'm with you, okay? I'm the same way. Uh, when I get up out of my easy chair at night, sometimes I go in the kitchen. What? Why am I here? I, I don't even know why I'm in the kitchen. I know none of you ever do that. You know? But we all have trouble with memory from time to time. I heard about uh, three elderly sisters that lived together. One of them was 92, the other was 94, and the other was 96 years of age. Well, the 96-year-old went upstairs to take a bath, and she got one foot in the tub and she just kind of paused and she hollered down to the other two sisters and she said this, why am I here? Am I getting in the tub or getting out of the tub? <laughs> to which the 94 year old said, just a moment, I'll come up to help you. So she went up the stairs and about halfway up the stairs, she stopped. And she shouted through the house, Am I going up or am I going down? To which the 92-year-old sister who's sitting around the table drinking coffee said to herself, she said, I hope I never get that forgetful. And just for good luck, of course, she on the table like that. And she said, Y'all just hold on a minute. I'll come and help. But I need to go and see who's at the door. <laughs> Now, most of you probably don't have that kind of problem, but in all seriousness, I think that the Lord Jesus knew as human beings and our imperfection that we'd have trouble remembering. And to be quite honest with you, I, I still remember when my father passed away and, and how it happened. I remember all the details about it. But I'll be honest with you folks, I don't want to remember that. I don't, I don't even want to think about how my dad died. I really don't. I want to remember how he lived. You know? And, uh, and I think most of you would agree with that. I can remember. I have an easy time remembering some of those things. But as we come to this service today, the Lord Jesus said, I want you to remember how I died. I want you to remember why I died. And so... He set the example the night before He died as He joined there with His disciples and He broke bread with them and gave us that example. He said, this do in remembrance of Me. In other words, I don't want you to forget. I want you to remember what it is God who came in the flesh has done for you. And so He set that in motion and now for over 2,000 years... Christians have been coming together and as they come together, as often as they come together, the Bible says they remember what it is that Jesus has done for them. And 
we certainly want to do that this morning, and we're going to be doing that. Here at First Baptist Jewett, we try to do this at least one a quarter. I don't know that that's definitely necessarily a fixed thing. I think is we feel the need we ought to have the Lord, the Lord somewhere to do it as often as we remember. But we'll do it here at least once a quarter. I'm thankful that we do that in obedience to what our Lord has said. But with that said, I want us to look together at what Paul wrote to the Corinthian church concerning communion concerning the Lord's Supper. So in honor of reading God's Word, would you stand with me as we look together in 1 Corinthians chapter 11? We're going to begin in verse 17 as he wrote to the Corinthian church. Now remember, the Corinthian church had its share of issues. And the Apostle Paul, all through this letter, he's, he's reminding them of some things that they need to get in order in the house of God. And, and this was one of those matters. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17, Paul wrote, Now in giving these instructions, I do not praise you since you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part I believe it. For there must also be factions among you that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others. One is hungry and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you, not despise, or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which He was betrayed took bread. And when He had given thanks, He broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of Me. In the same manner, He also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in My blood. This do as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till He comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep or have died. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may, be, we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment. And the rest I will set in order when I come. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we love you, praise you, and worship you this morning. And God, we want to honor you by remembering, Lord, what it is that you have done for all of us. Lord, all of us who put our faith and our trust in You. And Lord, I know the cry still goes out. And Lord, there's still opportunity for the lost. God, for them to come to You. And Lord, to recognize what You have done for them as well. And I pray, God, that this morning, that we would remember Your death, burial, and resurrection. And Lord, we would remember it the way that You have set forth. I pray, God, that we begin to examine our own lives and make sure that, Lord, we don't have known sin in our life before we partake, Lord, of this supper. God, I pray that You bless the preaching of Your Word today. and Lord, I pray that Jesus Christ would be high and lifted up in this place. For I ask it in Christ's name. Amen and amen. As we go to this passage of Scripture this morning, some of you are going to say amen and be thankful. But I don't have a three-part message today. I have a two-part sermon. 
The thing about that that you need to understand is I've got about 10 points under each section, okay? But I'm, I'm just kidding with you. We, we'll get out of here pretty quick. But we want to look at what the Apostle Paul wrote to this early New Testament church and some of the, the issues that have arisen in that church. And he wanted to deal with them, and he does here in this letter. Notice with me, first of all, the Corinthian church abused the Lord's Supper. They abused the Lord's Supper. Now, I think as we approach this, first of all, we need to understand what the church really is, okay? What is he? Is he he's writing to the church, but is he writing to the, the local Baptist church on the corner or the, the local Methodist church on the corner? No, he's, he's writing to an assembled body of believers. He's writing to the people that make up the church. You see, First Baptist Church, Jewett, Texas, as beautiful as these facilities it is, and we, we have dedicated them to the Lord, and certainly they belong to Him, but this building is not the church. The church is the people that assemble together and that come together. So understand this as we read this letter. He's not just writing to a building. He's writing to a people. He's writing to the assembled people there in Corinth. And he has a message that he wants to share with them. You see, the Corinthian church would come together for worship, which included a meal. And right now, some of you are thinking, I wish we had that going on right now. But they would, they would have a meal together. They would worship. And they would have the Lord's Supper kind of all packaged together in one. And after about uh, 300 years after the time of Christ, the church kind of got away from that of, of bringing the meal and the Lord's Supper together. Although there's certainly nothing wrong with that. But I think there was some, some issues with it. So the church kind of separated the two. Today we call it a potluck, okay? Well, we come together and we have hot love meals. Why? Because we love each other and as family we want to gather together for fellowship over a meal. Well, it kind of carried that same kind of idea. It was a love feast, if you will, when they came. It's what they, they call it. And they would come together and they would have this meal together. Well, the problem uh, in the early church, uh, the problem that they had, Paul rebukes them on account of it. Look what he said in verse 17. Now I give these instructions, I do not praise you, since you come together, not for the better, but for the worse. He's, he's bringing them home to them, but there's a problem with the way that they observe the Lord's Supper. I don't think that the problem was in the meal itself, but it was just their hearts and the condition of their heart as they approached the Lord's Supper. And the problem with the meal was this. There was... There were rich people and there were poor people. Matter of fact, when you get outside of these United States of America, that's about what you see. You either have very wealthy people or you have very poor people. And in the church, it was no different. There were the poor that had come to Christ. There were Gentiles who had come to Christ. There were the rich who had come to Christ. There were the Jews who had come to Christ as well. So you had just a whole mix of people coming together there at the church of Corinth. But the problem of the issue was this, that when they came together over the meal, that the rich had a lot of food, and they would bring that to eat at the meal. But they were kind of hoarding it for themselves. In other words, they were going ahead of the poor. And the poor, in effect, would walk away hungry from the meal. And Paul says, that is not right. And basically what Paul's trying to say is, you're sinning against God. Because you should be sharing what you have with the poor. And so the Apostle Paul wanted to make that clear. And as a result of that, their heart was not clean when they went to the Lord's Supper and they partook of the Lord's Supper. And the Apostle Paul had a very strong rebuke about this matter. In 1 Corinthians 1, he wrote that there were contentions among them. So this was a kind of a mixed up, messed up church, if you will. Now I know that we think that the churches today are the only churches that ever had problems. 
But the reality is, is that the church, even in Paul's day, had, very, had some difficult issues that they had to work through. And the Apostle Paul is trying to correct them, trying to help them with some of those issues. You know, everywhere I go, I hear about divisions in the church. Or I hear about cliques and, and, and the same kind of thing that was going on in Paul's day in the church. Folks, that should not be in the house of God. Man. Listen, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. Right. I don't care if you're rich. I don't care if you're poor. I don't care if you're a king or if you're a slave. Wherever you're at in life, we all approach God the same way. And that's with the shed blood of His Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So when the church of Jesus Christ comes together, when we gather together, when we assemble together, the last thing that should happen is that there's cliques and there's division and there's feuding and there's fighting. Because friends, I tell you when that's happening, what we're saying to the world is, is that we do not care about you. Go to hell if you want to. That's strong. But folks, that's the message that the world sees. We don't need to be feuding and fussing and fighting over temperatures and colors and but things, like things I like, things that you like. No, our focus ought to be on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And we ought to lift Him up. And when we lift Him up, then we will have less opportunities to fuss and feud about things that we don't like to care about. Because our heart will be about the things that God cares about. Cares Amen. about. Amen. You know, I have felt nothing but love at First Baptist Jewett since I have arrived here. I have felt, Marcia has felt, just the warmest, friendliest fellowship in this assembly. And I praise the Lord for it. And I pray that that continues to happen. But if the church in general across America and even in other places of the world, they get in trouble when they get hung up over such things as this. Listen to me, friend. That should not be in the church of God. And certainly we should not be participating in the Lord's Supper if that's where our heart is. Right. You see, we need to be honoring Christ. We need to make sure that our lives are pure, are pure before the Lord Jesus Christ. The poor Christians of that day were being shut out of the love feast or out of the fellowship according to verse 21. The rich had plenty, but they would not share the love feast that they were having, Paul said, had become drunken parties. Can you imagine? I still remember a friend of mine. He's an evangelist. He's getting ready to retire. He called me the other day, and I was thinking about this as I was preparing for this message. He went to one of the largest churches in Savannah, Georgia, and took uh, God called him there to pastor the church. He was invited to go over to a Sunday school party, and when he went over to that party, they had a wet bar on the pool. And they were serving alcoholic beverages at that party. He was just bold enough and brash enough to get everybody's attention. And he said, you might carry on with this party. He said, but you will no longer teach in our church. He said, you're welcome to come, but as your pastor, I will not take part in this gathering here today. And he walked out of the party and he left. Folks, I was living there at the time, and I still remember it in the newspapers. Bomb threat at Calvary Baptist Church. Pastor's front window gets blown out. I mean, his life was threatened just about every day that he was there for taking a stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. What a shame that the church would gather and get drunk together. But that's what was happening here in this text. Paul said, you're all not, not just having a drink, they were getting drunk. That's what he says here. Coming together and getting drunk. He said, Take that, that shouldn't be in the house of God. That should not be what we come together for. We're saved by the same person. We need to rally around Him and our heart needs to be with Him. You see, Jesus settled our sin debt. And when we as believers come together, there should be no distinction of persons. There shouldn't certainly be this kind of party and reveling going on. Amen? Amen. Mahatma Gandhi, some of you still may remember him. He was a Hindu. Gandhi nevertheless had a great admiration for the Lord Jesus Christ when he was young. 
He, was, he studied law in, in South Africa and became a very prominent citizen. But he, he studied the life of Christ and he, was, he admired Him from a distance. When he was asked about why he so adamantly opposed the Lord's church, he said, look, I love the same Jesus that you love. But he said, I don't want any part of what you call church because it doesn't look like what the Bible describes as the church. In Mahatma Gandhi, we later on found out that when he was a child, when he was young, growing up, he had gone to one of the local churches, a Christian church, because he was exploring Christianity. And when he arrived at the door, one of the ushers greeted him at the door, and they said, you're at the wrong place. You don't belong here. And would not allow him to go in the church. The cause of his back and had no part of him. Folks, that should never happen in the Lord's church. Man. But that's the very thing Paul's dealing with here. The rich and, and the poor. Listen folks, there's nothing wrong with being rich. Praise God for rich people. I mean, you think about it. You think about that poor guy that got thrown in the ditch or what? A rich man, a man came by who had, had money, put him on the motel and said, hey, here's some more money. Take care of this guy. You remember the story? Thank God for that. Thank God for the poor. Thank God that they're still around. Some of the happiest people I've ever met in all my life, you think they're poor here, but folks go to another country and you'll see what poor is. Some of the most joyful, happy, lovingest, caringest people you'll ever meet. And Paul said that there should be no distinction of persons in the church. The Lord's church should be the most inviting, loving place in the world. Amen. When people come into the Lord's church, we ought to with open arms open our arms up. Just as Jesus did on the cross. But we ought to gather them in and bring them into the house of God. We must love people the way that Jesus loves people. Amen. Amen. And then secondly, the Corinthian church needed guidance and purity. And we find that Paul gave them this in verse 23. There are at least four things that we're going to look at real quick. Number one, as we approach the Lord's Supper, we should look back. We should look back. What does Paul say here in our text? Verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which He was betrayed took bread. And then he goes on to talk about what Jesus did and how He broke the bread and how He poured the wine. The bread being representing the body and then the, the uh, juice or the, the wine representing the blood of Christ. You see, for believers... It's not just a historical fact that this took place. Listen, it's a spiritual reality for believers when we come together. As we look back on what the Lord Jesus did for us, it's not something that we look back on and we think, well, we know that that happened and, and it's a good thing that that happened. No, it's as if we experience it with our Lord. When we come to the Lord's table, we're remembering what He did for us. And we follow suit. In other words, we repent of our sins. We die to self. That Christ might live in us. And so there's something more going on there. So we look back. So when we do look back, we join with Christ in the death, burial, and resurrection. So as we approach the Lord's table this morning, that's the attitude that we need to have. As we reflect back, we need to reflect back on what He did. But then I want you to know that we ought to look ahead. Look at what He says in the last part of verse 26. Three words. Till He comes. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of Me. Paul writing to the church here, He says, do this, remember what the Lord has done for you, till He comes. You see, we're waiting on the Lord to come back. We rejoice today because Jesus is not dead. He's alive. Amen. He died for my sins, yes, but on the third day, He rose from the dead. And folks, He's coming back. What did He say over in John 14? He said, let not your heart be troubled. You remember the verse? Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. He said, believe also in Me. In My Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. 
Then he said this, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Praise the Lord. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, praise God, I will come again and receive you unto myself. And where I am, what? There you will be also. So when the Apostle Paul says, till he comes, the Apostle Paul, he's remembering back. Now Paul was not there that night when Jesus spoke those words, but he remembers, he heard them from the other disciples, and then he was taught by the Lord himself. And it was a reality to the Apostle Paul that Jesus Christ was coming again. What a day that's going to be, folks. So we look back at what Jesus did for us, but then we look forward, right? How long do we look forward? Till He comes. We continue to look forward till He comes. What a wonderful promise we have. Jesus is coming again. And then we need to look within. Verse 27, Paul writes, Therefore, whoever eats this bread drinks this cup of the Lord, how? In an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of of the Lord. Did Paul say that we had to be worthy to partake of the supper? If he had said that, none of us could partake of the supper. No, not at all. That's not what he said. He said, those who partake in an unworthy manner. You see, it's all in the approach. It's how we approach the Lord's Supper. The reality is that, folks, that I am saved by the grace of God. You see, I am nothing, but it is Christ who lives in me that makes me something. Amen. It's all about the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all about His grace. It's all about His mercy. Every Listen to me. Every one of you who are sitting here today, you're not worthy to approach this table. But we can approach this table in a worthy manner. What is Paul talking about here? Well, let's go back to what he's just said. He said, look, your heart obviously is not right because you're shutting these four Christians. They would be approaching the Lord's table in an unworthy manner. As a matter of fact, if you go in and read the text here, it said that as, as a result, what's happening? Some of you were sick. And some of you have even some have even died because they partook of the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. This is what I believe he's talking about. I believe what the Apostle Paul is saying to us is that if we have known sin in our life and we're saying to God, God, I love you, but I don't care what you say, I'm going to go on sinning, then we are approaching the Lord's table in an unworthy manner. You see, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the reality is, is even though I believe that, Lord, that Jesus Christ is my Savior, even though that I believe that He saved me and that one day will be my heaven, uh, one day heaven will be my home, listen to me, I still fail God. I still sin against God. And the Holy Spirit of God convicts my heart. And when God convicts my heart, then it's at that moment, it's at that time that I need to repent and ask God to forgive me. And as we approach the Lord's table this morning, you're going to be given an opportunity to just pause for a moment and search your own heart. I can't do that for you. The person sitting by you can't do that. You have to examine your own heart. And if there's something there that you need to turn over to the Lord, I know all of us have struggles. If there's something there though that we need to just say, God is yours. I know that it's sin. I know that it's wrong. Lord, I don't want to partake. I don't want to do this. Because folks, it's, it's just like almost like we're slapping the face of God when we do. You see, Jesus went to the cross to die for my sin. If I've got no sin in my life, I need to repent. I need to ask Him to forgive me. And then I can approach the Lord's table in a worthy manner. So we need to look within. But then lastly, we need to look around. Look at verse 33. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. In other words, serve one another. Look around you. You have brothers and sisters in Christ sitting all around you in this auditorium today. I want to encourage you to do something. Don't look around you with a critical spirit. Understand that this is the family of God, warts and all. Hey, all of us have problems. All of us have issues. 
We look around, and this is my family, and I'm a part of this wonderful family of God. And when we come together at the Lord's table, it's family time. It's the time when we gather together. Hey, I can't wait until the day comes that Jesus promised us about. He said, one day, we're going to sit at the same table. We're going to sit at the table with the Lord. And one day, we're going to do that. But until He comes, we gather together as family around the Lord's table. It ought to be a, a wonderful experience. It ought to be a, a solemn experience as we gather together. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. Now look upon His face, the One who saved me, what? By His grace. When He takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a glorious day that's going to be. Folks, today is a glorious day. You and I can gather together as believers of the Lord's house in remembrance of Him and partake of the Lord's Supper. Who can participate? Only those who repented of their sin and asked Jesus Christ to be the Lord and be their Savior. And then they follow through the believers' baptism by worship. What we believe. I believe that's biblical. But perhaps this morning you never trusted Christ as your Savior. Why not now? Amen. Why not now? Why not trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior? You see, He died for your sin. And he died for mine as well. He paid for our sin debt. And what do we do? We must repent of our sin and we must invite Him into our lives to be our Lord and be our Savior. It is Jesus Christ and Christ alone that will save us. It's not, it's not becoming a member of this church, but it's repentance and crying out to God for salvation through Jesus. Christ. That's what makes a person a believer. And then beyond that, we follow through with believers' baptism, following our Lord and our Savior in baptism. Maybe today there's something going on in your life and maybe you don't feel worthy. Listen, remember, you'll never be worthy, okay? Don't ever. If we waited to the day that we were worthy, we'd never get to experience this together. But maybe there's something in your life you know you need to repent of. Maybe it's a brother or sister that you've offended and you need to go to them and say, I need your forgiveness. Whatever it might be. Maybe you need to deal with that right now. I want to give you a chance to do that.